Alrighty then. Now that I'm mic'd, I can actually start. Uh, first, I want to apologize. So I'm Misi, also known as Karin, here to talk about neurohacking. Uh, first, a little about me, um, my day job. I work in auditory neuroscience, uh, which will become obvious as most of my examples will involve the ear in one way or another, just because it's what I'm most familiar with. And the first thing I wanted to get into um, is what is neurohacking? And to me, there are three main areas of neurohacking. Uh, the first one is observation without changing, trying to see how nerves work in their natural state. Um, once you know how they work, building models is a really good way of finding out if you really understand what's going on. And the third is changing how the neurons work. Um, either by disruption or extra stimulation, seeing if you can predict or if you can record uh, what those changes do. What do I mean by from the bottom up? Um, I mean that I like to understand the very basic biology and the electronics behind something before I start looking at large systems. I think it gives a greater understanding. So my plan is to do uh, biology review uh, at a pretty basic level. I won't try to bore you too much. Uh, tying into some of the electrical concepts and then go into some experiments that are accessible to a do-it-yourselfer or a neurohacker. So the first thing I'm going to do is take you back to what's probably middle school science. I don't know about you, but I had to build those models in shoeboxes with organelles draped from the top. Um, I've only labeled two things here because they're really the only two things that are going to carry over for us. Uh, the cell body itself contains the nucleus and is surrounded by a cell membrane. A neuron is also an animal cell. It's a very specialized and sort of funny looking animal cell. You can see the cell body still contains the nucleus. Uh, there are dendrites surrounding the cell body and these function as the neuron's receptor receptors or sensors. Um, there is a long, skinny portion of the neuron that's called the axon. Its main function is to get signals from one end of the cell to the other, and this is why signals can travel so far in your body is the length of this axon. And then there's the terminal end, which is the transmitter end. Um, it releases neurochemicals, it releases neurotransmitters. Um, it's also a source of a fair amount of electrical activity. And I've gone through the first two points here already, uh, the dendrites of the receptors, signals leave via the terminal end. Um, the currents in neurons consist of positively charged ions, not necessarily electrons, although in theory everything has a balance. These positively charged ions are potassium, sodium, and calcium. And the main electrical event is an action potential and can be considered a DC pulse. Uh, talk a little more about a cell membrane. You might again remember from middle school science that a cell membrane is two layers of lipid molecules, which is basically a hydrophobic section surrounded by two hydrophilic sections. Um, and by its very nature, this bilayer has an intrinsic ca capacitance, uh, which does some interesting things to the electric properties of a neuron. Um, there's also the various resistances across and um, along the membrane. There are ion channels within the membrane that allow current flow. And some of these channels are passive, just allowing ion diffusion from one side to another. Some of them are gated, um, either chemically or voltage gated. And what that means is that these ion channels can snap shut or open depending on what the local membrane potential is, or what chemicals are present or maybe attached. Um, and then there are also some active pumps that pump ions from one side to the other, probably against a gradient. And these function as the cell's batteries. Uh, many, but not all, neurons have some form of insulation in the form of myelin. Myelin prevents current from leaving the axon, which is the long distance portion. So what this does 
beyond even simple insulation, but it increases the neural propagation speed since you're not limited by diffusion. Electrical events basically jump from one end to another very quickly. There are still some membrane or some neurons that are unmyelinated with certain systems. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so modeling current flow within the neuron is basically a matter of summing up uh, what I've listed so far. There's an intrinsic current um, created by the surroundings for the given neuron. Um, there's the current of the various ions um, in, based on whether they're being pumped or diffused. Uh, there's the membrane capacitance and any membrane current that could be potentially out. Um, and when you sum all that together, you get the total current for any given neuron. Uh, what this ends up creating is uh, the classic neuron event, which is the action potential. So there are a couple of things in this figure that I want you to notice. First is that the resting potential of any given neuron hovers around minus 70 millivolts. Um, if something happens to change the surrounding membrane potential past a certain threshold, and that threshold differs from neuron to neuron, then the action potential cascade is triggered. The first thing that happens is that the sodium channels open, and sodium rushes into the cell. Uh, the potassium channels open, and then as the channels close and excess potassium diffuses away um, and the ion pumps kick in, mem uh, the potential drops down actually below the resting value. There's a little refractory period uh, before the nerve can fire again. Uh, so finally, something that you can do um, on a single neuron is uh, just take recordings of action potentials from any given electron. So what do you need for that? You need something with a live functioning neuron. Um, there are a number of ways you can go about this. The simplest is probably um, insect models are rel relatively common because insects are relatively easy to get um, and easily anesthetized to remove legs or whatever. And most people don't feel too bad about killing cockroaches. You need a recording electrode, usually something like a needle, very fine, that can be placed inside a single neuron. You need a ground electrode. You need an amplifier. And you need some method of monitoring your signal. One of the really basic ways of doing this would be through um, like a speaker. Uh, you can listen and action potential sound like little bursts of static. An oscilloscope is nice. You can see the spikes as they travel. If all of this seems overly complicated, there are some resources. Um, getting ahead of myself, let me show you a little bit about what single neuron data might look like. Um, each one of these little spikes that you see is an action potential. Um, there are a couple of things that I want people to notice here is um, most neurons have some level of spontaneous activity. They fire action potentials at a regular or irregular rate depending on the type they are. And influencing these neurons either by um, artificially changing the potential in their vicinity, um, injecting current, uh, sometimes touching or manipulating a sensory cell that might be attached to the neuron, they change the spontaneous activity. Some of these will inhibit, some of them will increase. Uh, some neurons have a very regular spiking rate when they're being stimulated. Some spike a whole bunch right at the beginning and then they taper off. Uh, it very much changes based on what type of cell and what type of neuron and what type of system you're looking at. Um, and now resources, if all of this seems complicated. There is a company called Backyard Brains that provides some really excellent supplies for the backyard scientist. Um, they sell kits called spiker boxes that do these type of single unit recordings. Um, they have an iPhone app and last I heard an Android app in the works for basically turning your phone into an oscilloscope, which is kind of cool. 
Um, these spiker boxes can come pre-assembled um, or if you're cheaper and more of a do-it-yourselfer, you can actually put them together yourself. Um, and they sell cockroaches in case you don't want to go out and capture your own. So everything I've done so far has been what I consider very low level, single units, one at a time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about neurons working on ensemble. And probably the most obvious example of that would be the brain. Uh, the brain, if you just look at the brain, it looks like sort of an amorphous mass of tissue. Uh, but it is really a very, very highly structured, complicated organ. Um, you can see from the lower picture, this is just a small subset of some of the neural pathways that track in the brain. And you can see the level of organization, all of the fibers running in parallel. Uh, there are millions, literally, of processes and feedback loops and communications happening with the brain all the time. I'm going to give one example of a fairly well-established feedback circuit. This is called the vestibular ocular reflex. And basically what its function is, is to make it so that when you're walking down the street and you're bumping and you're moving and changing from side to side, what you see looks relatively stable. Unlike those old video recorders before image stabilization software where the image is bouncing all around. And if you think about it, that's kind of impressive that we can do that. And it's a relatively simple circuit. Uh, you may know that there are balance organs in the inner ear that are um, influenced by motion, whether rotational or just changing. Um, there is a series of neurons from each one of these that directly access the muscles in the, around the eyes. So if you move to one side, your eyes will move in the opposite direction almost immediately. There's a very, very short latency there. And it happens by, by exciting the muscles to contract on one side and inhibiting them from contracting on the other. So that if you shift left, for example, your eyes shift right. And this is relatively easily measured. You can get good nerve conductance speeds by putting somebody on a platform and moving the platform. And you can very easily and non-invasively measure the muscles around the eye just by placing little skin electrodes around the eye. And you get a very good idea of how quickly this all happens. I'm going to talk some about the EEG, since it's probably the most common method of monitoring neural signals. Uh, the EEG, or an electroencephalogram, is measured with electrodes placed on the scalp. They're just skin electrodes. You don't need to go through the skin. You can just paste electrodes on. Um, and what they do is they measure the ensemble electrical activity that they can see. So clearly, the more electrodes you have, uh, the more signals you can record. This um, example down at the bottom were all recorded simultaneously from different electrodes. Uh, the location of the electrode can determine which portion of the brain that you're monitoring. Uh, the further apart they're spaced, the more brain in between them, the more ensemble activity you'll see. Uh, if you want any sort of specificity, your electrodes need to get closer and closer together. Um, for equipment for this, the, the, it's relatively similar to the single unit experiment. You need the electrodes. You need an amplifier, um, especially if you have a number of different electrodes, like a multi-channel amplifier is nice, or a differential amplifier so that you can screen out some of the background noise from the parts of the brain you're not as interested in. So brain waves which people sort of toss around this phrase fairly often as if, what, as if everybody understood what they are. Um, and it occurred to me later that most people don't really know what brain waves are. All brain waves are are an ensemble EEG, which you see in that main box up at the top there. Um, and you run it through a spectrum analyzer, like a fast Fourier transform. Or if you're not familiar with that math, it's like putting an audio signal through an equalizer so that you can separate out the bass and the treble. 
So the various types of brain waves are either low frequency or high frequency. Delta waves are low frequency. Beta waves are high frequency. The rest of them are sort of in the middle. And the reason people are interested in them is that different types of waves can be an indicator of the mental state of the person being monitored. Like a high peak in delta waves, like you see here, is usually indicative of somebody who's sleeping um, or very, very relaxed. Lots of beta waves means that there's a lot going on in somebody's thinking or being sort of stimulated with a lot of information. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about with brain waves. Um, but here, I'm going to give another example of something that's done with an EEG. Um, if you take the EEG of a person, um, and let's say you've got somebody, like, it, all right, let's start back at the beginning. Um, if you want to measure how well somebody can hear, and this person is not capable of pressing the little button or raising their hand when they hear a tone, uh, this is a measure that can be done. It's quite non-invasive. It's a three-channel EEG, usually one above each ear, one at the forehead. They play a short, usually a 15 millisecond sound repeatedly into the ear and record the EEG at the same time. Um, this is not a very strong signal, so you need to average the EEG over many repetitions. But what falls out is this waveform that you see in the bottom left corner here. It's a very standard waveform. It looks just about the same for every normal hearing animal out there. Um, and the various peaks and valleys correspond to the different areas of the brain as they received the information about the sound. So the very first peak there is actually the nerve that leads from the inner ear um, out towards the brain. And they travel up through the brain stem up to the higher level functions. And the fun thing about that auditory brainstem response measure is that it was found by somebody who was basically screwing around with an oscilloscope um, and an EEG. I mean, it was basically your neurohacking. Uh, it got published many, many years ago, and nobody really recognized the significance or the function. But when they tracked back through the papers, they were able to see that somebody had been playing with this for a long time. Um, so far. Everything I've talked about is sort of the first section of neurohacking that I was mentioning, the, in, the um, monitoring, measuring, seeing how things work in their relatively neural native state. I'm going to move on a little bit to modeling. Uh, this is an area that interests me, but not one that I know a great deal about. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about it, point you at some resources, and that's about all I'm qualified to talk about. Um, but it's very applicable to robotics and AI research. Uh, there are a number of people out there trying to recreate and model how, for example, insects work in their environment based on their input, how they make decisions, uh, things like that. Uh, the fun thing that I think about that is uh, you can put a number of these little models together and get sort of complex group behaviors like you see with hiving insects, which I think is fairly phenomenal. Um, one of the resources that I found for this is a site, animatlab.com, where there's open source software that you can take and play with. And they've got a couple of demos set up that people can play with and tweak. Um, but you have to know even more than just the neural processes themselves. You have to know a fair deal about their environment. Um, how their bodies fit together, so how they're capable of moving. I'm going to show one little example from their site, um, which is the crawfish escape response. And you see the ball falls on its antenna, and it goes shooting backwards. Uh, if you've ever seen a crawfish or a lobster do that escape, it's a very stereotyped behavior. They all do it the same, and they're able to monitor it fairly well based on the mechanics of the crawfish and what they know about their neural responses. And again, that's all I can really qualify to say about modeling. Um, so I'm going to move on to the third portion of neurohacking, um, which is changing the information received or changing how neurons work, either through disruption um, or other methods. 
this is by definition invasive. So if you're experimenting on yourself um, or your friend, use a lot of caution. Um, there are three main ways by which people change how neurons work. One is by electrical stimulation. Um, you can do it with magnetic stimulation. And the third method, which is not one I'm going to go into in great detail, but there's a heck of a lot of literature out there, chemical manipulation. And pretty much every drug that you take affects neurons in some way, shape, or form, whether it's through neurotransmitters or the electrical properties of the neurons or something. So first I'll talk about electrical stimulation. The principle is the same as that single unit data that I showed you before. Um, you can change the firing rates of neurons, but you can also disrupt um, feedback loops and uh, systems to that extent. To ch achieve any sort of specificity with electrical stimulation, you need direct access to the neuron, which is pretty invasive. You, mean, you sort of need to get down there into the brain. Um, but obviously, you can get effects with more general stimulation, too. And as you might be aware, something like electroconvulsive therapy um, is more or less whole body. But it does have neural effects, too. It's just very broad-based. One of the main problems with very diffuse stimulation, of course, is the heart and muscular effects with large area stimulation. Um, and beyond the safety issue, this can influence your data as well. Like if you're doing broad-based electrical stimulation, um, you can get muscle contraction directly due from the electrical stimulation, which in research, it's always a problem trying to separate muscle artifact out from neural responses. Um, I'm going to take you back to the Backyard Brains website. They have a project called the Robo Roach, which is, this actually looks quite a bit more invasive than it is. This is a live behaving cockroach that's had a number of things glued to its back for the most part. The only directly invasive portion here is that they've attached electrodes to the antenna. And the whole point of this is that they can steer this cockroach around by electrically stimulating the antenna, um, much in the same way touching the antenna would do, uh, giving the cockroach information that they're running into something. The interesting thing about this is that it doesn't work terribly long. The cockroach adapts very quickly to electrical stimulation. So pretty soon, they learn to ignore it. Um, so there's obviously a lot more going on than the very simple behaviors that people were thinking. Um, I'm going to move on to magnetic stimulation. Uh, much as you're probably aware, currents can be uh, induced if by placing conductive materials in a magnetic field. Um, and this works in neurons as well, uh, especially with it. And it's, um, there are commercially available devices called uh, RTMI, uh, repetitive magnetic. I'm blanking on what it's called. Um, but it's, uh, it basically just is a magnet that is rapidly flipping from one polarity to another. It uh, can be placed near the skull. It's relatively non-invasive compared to electrical stimulation. Um, it is not terribly specific, depending on, I mean, you can control an electric field fairly closely, so you can influence just certain parts of the brain. Um, but not that small. Usually, you've got entire lobes affected. Uh, magnetic stimulation has both short and long-term effects on neural activity. Most of the effects people have documented have been confusion, something of altered states. But a couple of studies recently published have shown very interesting effects of stimulating the temporal lobe um, and how it affects analytical versus creative thinking, which is fairly interesting. Um, they can change some, some behaviors in humans and some problem-solving skills that um, most normal people don't have. Um, so at this point, I'm more or less going to wrap it up by saying that neuroscience and neurohacking are accessible to a do-it-yourself a crowd and basement scientists. Specialized equipment absolutely helps. But it can, most of it can be built or 
purchased for a relatively reasonable price these days. Um, neurohacking is not limited to interest in altered states. There's a lot more to learn out there. And I'm going to put up a list of resources for people who are interested. A lot of these I've gone over before. Uh, but things you should look at are uh, take a look at the Nauticon archives. I tried hard not to replicate information from the last couple of years, especially. Um, but there were some very good presentations on things that somebody can do. Uh, the Backyard Brains website has, beyond the experiments that I showed you here, they've got a number of others along with a lot of resources for people. The website mindcreators.com is associated with the modeling site that I showed you, but Mind Creators itself has a lot of very good basic science information. I pulled a lot of my slides from their website um, because they document it so well. Um, and so it's really good reading if you're interested in modeling or just interested in knowing cellular physiology at a better level than what I've shown you here. There are a number of different newsletters out there. I'll warn you that most of it is, at the risk of <laughs> being crude, people going, you know, dude, I can get high by holding a magnet to my head, um, which isn't really the most interesting part to me. Uh, so I, there was a lot of filtering I did when I put together the resources. Uh, but Neurohacker Quarterly is an interesting blog. Um, and there are more out there, too. And if you're interested in biology-specific hackerspaces, which I am, there are only two that I know of right now, um, one on each coast. There's one in the San Francisco Bay Area called BioCurious. And then there's GenSpace in New York City. Uh, this is primar primarily a genetics lab, so it's not really neuroscience friendly, but it's out there in case you're interested. And Backyard Brains actually works very closely with a number of hackerspace type communities. And that's all I have. Anyone have questions? Yes. <laughs> that you'd have to ask. <laughs> um, yeah. I do not have experience with it. Um, what is it supposed to do? Um, 10 sensors is plenty. The problem that I've seen with a lot of stuff that people are bringing together is that they run it through that um, spectrum filter before they give you the data. So you can't ever look at the raw EEG, which to me is more interesting because you know I'll do the I'll do the secondary processing myself if I want it. Um, but they just give you one of those bar graphs with um, with the, you know delta waves versus beta waves. Um, well, the auditory brainstem response is one of the examples that I showed you. Um, you can certainly take it to the frequency domain. I just like being I, and maybe it's a control freak thing. I like doing it myself. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. That's a good question. Um, that is, I can point you towards the news release that I saw. Um, they specifically affected the temporal lobe um, and probably a very small portion of the temporal lobe. And they took a problem that is one that's, it's one of those logic problems, you know, connect these dots with no more than four lines and never pick up your pen. And most people had a really hard time with this particular problem because it required a leap that most people won't make that your lines don't have to stop and end on dots. Is, And before stimulation, um, or the control group, none of their normal adults were able to solve the problem. And then their stimulated group it was something like 40% of them were able to solve it in the first try. So it clearly did something, assuming that their groups were more or less equivalent to begin with. From my perspective, I'm less interested in changing how people think than understanding why we think the way we do. So to that extent, 
it doesn't certainly doesn't answer the question, but it points at one more piece of that puzzle. Um, you know, we solve problems the way we do because this is how we're wired, and finding out exactly how that's put together is fairly fascinating. Um, most likely, most likely what it is is they're flipping the polarity of the magnet and inducing a current in the temporal lobe. Um, but sometimes science journalists get that not so right. Yeah. Not offhand. Of what? <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that. I've... It sounds like a misuse of science. Most directly, um, I can. T I, I don't know a lot of specifics because this is outside my field. Um, but most directly, you know, there are a number of disorders that can be treated by ablating certain parts of the brain or destroying certain parts of the brain, destroying certain um, connections. Um, and obviously, that doesn't make somebody normal, but it might interfere with a brain circuit that's misfiring, for example, like an epilepsy or something like that. Um, more on a basic science level, if we understand what's going wrong, we might be able to prevent it or change it in development or catch it early while it can still be changed. Uh, and that's the direction that basic science research typically goes. It, a lot of basic science research isn't going to be capable of helping people who are suffering now. It's going to be aimed at preventing suffering in the future. Anything else? Right. Ah, one more. I am not familiar with it. That, that's, I think that's where most of this is going, honestly. I think the insect stuff that I was talking about is very low level. Uh, but AI is pretty, it, it's getting pretty complex. Whether it's actually approaching the complexity of a brain, I couldn't say. Um, that's interesting. I would take a look at that. All right, thank you guys.